25, and we're going to do some more security engineering, see how far we get. And if any students wish to make an early presentation, let me know in the chat, and I'll do that like after the lecture, and um, will have any people want to make early presentations. The normal presentations will be next week. I won't have any lecture at all, it'll just be student presentations, um, four minutes long, so uh, it'll probably use up the time. But we've got some chapter three to do today, so let's carry on with that. All right. So vulnerabilities, threats, and countermeasures. A question on the assignment. Are they supposed to be submitted on Canvas? Um, the only thing you have to submit in Canvas is your topic, the actual presentation you deliver in class. And I just record it. Yeah. You just, so you just do it in class, and I'll just record it here. You don't turn in anything. I'll just record it when you, when you present it. Um, your paper, which is due in a couple of weeks, that you can turn in on Canvas. But it's just uh, you know a page of text or so. All right. So emanations are radio emissions that leak confidential information. This was a government uh, project called Tempest to check for secrecy. And they found that normal desktop computers do in fact emit radiation, uh, the radio waves from which you can detect what's going on. And, you even, and the old CRT display screens emitted radio waves you could use to get an image of what was on the screen. And that was quite troubling. So they determined that you really pretty much had to work inside a basement room with no windows and metal all around if you wanted to be safe working on computers. Um, and this is the general, now covert channels is the general characteristic of this. A covert channel is a communication that violates your security policy. So you can have a storage channel. This is one way where you store things in a folder and others can see something about in that folder. For example, in Linux systems, you store something in the temp folder and other applications and other users can see what's in the temp folder, although modern versions actually have different subfolders in a temp folder controlled by each user to limit that. Um, and then there are timing channels. The time your web page takes to respond to something depends on things like the key. This is a huge problem with all encryption. Um, it's very hard to write encryption software that doesn't take a different amount of time to do encryption or decryption depending on the key, and therefore you can deduce something about the key from the time. And then there's backdoors. These are things uh, ways for people to get in the system without coming in with a normal username and password. One common form is the maintenance hook. Many products are designed with a special password that the maintainers can use to get in. So if you get locked out or the system crashes, they have a special way to get in to fix it. And, and Cisco in particular got caught doing this about eight times about three years ago. Many other products had secret backdoors. The problem is they're not that hard to find. And once you find them, people can get in other people's stuff. So this is not considered a good thing to leave in a production system. Yeah. Yes. So then well, it's a good question. Do th I don't think they generally have a backdoor for maintenance, but if they, if I haven't heard of that, if they would, it would be a. Well, it's an interesting issue, and I don't know how many people actually do. I think some managed service providers do have a backdoor, yeah. but they would especially put it. Well, you know, there are other things. For example, Microsoft, what they did was they made a thing that would pop up a box and you could send a random image back to Microsoft for analysis. So they could analyze your system without having a backdoor. And so there are other ways to do it, but I think you're right. I think especially managed service providers probably do have backdoors, but those they negotiate and the customer knows it. But if you build it in a product and put the same password on many things, devices you sell, then of course it's bad. They kind of have to tell the, the, the client, or Yeah. Yeah, you have to make sure the client knows about it. Well, you might. There's different, there's different ways to do it, but you're right. I and mean, if you're going to have this sort of thing, you definitely have to make sure the client knows about it and your credentials are different than other companies' credentials. Yeah. All right. So then, of course, there's all the malware, viruses, worms, um, logic bombs, and Trojans are more deep types of... of uh, Malware, logic bombs, wait until a certain condition and then take effect, like on a certain date. Uh, Trojans pretend to be one thing, but they're really something else, like SolarWinds pretended to be an update for security, and it was in fact a backdoor for the Russians to take over your system. And zero-day exploits are the most dangerous, most expensive, and rare attacks where there's an attack that's been discovered, but nobody has told the antivirus companies or the manufacturers, so there is no patch and no way to protect yourself. Those are very valuable. And uh, there's really almost nothing you can do about them, except if you have network segmentation and defense in depth, then even if somebody takes over one of your machines, there's some limit to the harm they can do. But there's no way to protect that one machine.
Well, you have yeah, a private nav, that's right. You can only protect other ways by, um, yeah. Anyway, so viruses, your original virus was code attached to an EXE file on a floppy disk. Now we got macro viruses and office documents. Boot sector viruses mainly were on floppy disks. There are viruses that hide from OS and antivirus by mutating, and there are ones that spread by multiple vectors like email and instant messages and shared file share folders and so on. So worms propagate, that's mostly what we have now. Um, Trojans lie about what they do, and rootkits replace part of the kernel or the operating system so that they, it's like your whole machine becomes a virtual machine and there are other processes happening that you cannot detect from the normal interface. Packers compress and obfuscate executables so the antivirus can't find them and you run it and it unzips and decompresses. So this is a way to make things smaller and a way to sneak it past defenses. UPX is a common open source packer and there are many others. We use it in the malware analysis class. And logic bombs, like I say, will wait for some kind of trigger condition and then execute the payload. So antivirus software mostly uses signatures, which is just a list of all the known viruses, a pattern of bytes, and therefore it doesn't have false positives. It only triggers when it really sees the virus, which is good because people don't like false positives blocking legitimate software. The problem is this is very easy to prevent. All you have to do is add some extra unnecessary code in between the instructions that randomly changes, and now it won't find the pattern expected. So this is a has low false positive, but it's pretty easy to sneak past. Heuristic behavior tries to detect anomalous behavior, like code that unzips itself, code that has unusual permissions, or code that does something unusual, and the problem is often legitimate code triggers the heuristic detection. So even though this is in all modern antivirus products, the sensitivity is often turned down very low because uh, otherwise it'll go off when you try to install normal software. Um, so server-side attacks exploit vulnerable services on a server. So you have a server that's doing something like file sharing, and so you exploit that service. SM, Microsoft Port 445, SMB file sharing is notoriously very vulnerable and a whole series of worms spread through it. Then there's client side attacks where you trick the client into downloading something bad like a PDF or an office file and it exploits a vulnerability in the software on the machine. And then there's web architecture. Uh, for example, if you have PHP web pages, they often look like this. You'll have a PHP script and then the name of a file in a parameter. So you can often replace that with a URL to a different file on the same or another machine. And that's called local file inclusion or remote file inclusion. And it lets you add code to a page that, that is not what should be on that page. Um, applets are Java applets that are platform independent. And they run on a Java virtual machine and you can put them on web pages. And there used to be ActiveX that people would use in Internet Explorer. I don't know if that's present anymore. Internet Explorer was officially retired today. ActiveX may be finally over. I'm not sure if there's any but still in Edge. But it was the Microsoft competitor for Java, a way to put compiled code on the server that would run fast in a browser. OWASP is the uh, open source group that determines web vulnerabilities, and they have their top 10 list, which is mainly what people know them for. These are the top 10 web vulnerabilities, broken access control, cryptographic failures, injections like SQL injection, integer design and misconfiguration, outdated components, like we said, um, authentication failures, data integrity, logging failures, and server-side request forgery, which is a little confusing where you manage to uh, cause a request to appear to come from a different place and have a different effect than it should. Anyway, those are the general categories of vulnerabilities that you most often see, and everybody pretty much plans their uh, vuln testing around the OWASP top 10. It's very common. So service-oriented architecture. You have your application is a bunch of services, multiple apps use the same service, and the services can be called in some dependent generic way, published in a directory. Um, so you have web services. It'll take data in XML or JSON, typically, which is just a way to organize data and send it up to the server. It might use SOAP, which we've seen before, which is uh, just a way of formatting data so it looks like a web request, or REST requests that put parameters in the URL where they look like folders. And your web services description language, I think WSDL, I think that's wrong, uh, is details what services are available on a machine. Uh, these are just various ways that data is sent up to a web server to be processed. 
And then there's database security. Your database stores a large amount of data, like all your customers' names and addresses and credit card numbers and things like that. And it turns out there's a lot of security flaws in databases. Inference attacks and aggregation attacks are threats. So um, I thought we were going to have, yeah, we're going to have more about them. All right. Um, so a primary key is a unique identifier of someone. This is why every company you go to gives you an ID card with a number on it, like your Safeway number, City York City College student number, and so on. You have to have some unique way to identify something, and they might change their name, they might move, and so you have to somehow keep track of them still being the same person. So everybody assigns you a number. Uh, 20 years ago, everybody tried using social security numbers, but the US government said you're not allowed to do that, so all the American companies had to quit using that, and that's why every company has to assign you their own number to be with them. That's called the primary key. So there can only be one record with that primary key. No other person can have the same primary key again. That's the idea, it's a unique identifier. So polyinstantiation is where two rows can have the same primary key, but they have different data for each clearance level. Now the point here, I just want to mention these attacks back here. An inference attack is where you take data at one level, at low security level, you deduce what's at a high level. For example, you can have a list of phone numbers and they're all sequential, but some of them are missing on a low level. Those must be the high privilege one. This used to work back when we had WebEx systems where you dial like the last four digits. You would have a directory of all the unclassified stuff, and the numbers that are not there are the classified things, and so on. And an aggregation attack is another way of combining low security data to predict the high security data. And these are defenses. So um, inference, polyinstantiation is where you have the prim same primary key will give you a different amount of data depending on your clearance level. So you can query for one person, but if you don't have high clearance, you'll just get the unclassified stuff. But if you have top secret clearance, you'll get all the data, including top secret data. And that way, they won't find that record missing at a low security level. They'll just find a small amount of data there. So they won't be able to guess which person has the high security data by seeing who's missing. So. Um, you can infer restricted information, like I mentioned. You can tell when the US military is doing major things by finding out how many pizzas are being ordered because they make their staff stay late to plan it and they all order pizzas. So the total number of pizza order goes up on days of major military maneuvers. So that's a low security activity that leaks information about a high security activity. And aggregation uses many low level facts to deduce restricted information, like I say, looking up all the phone numbers and deducing which ones are missing to find out which phone numbers go to classified people. So you can, to control these, you can put your pizza vendors under non-disclosure agreements. That would make their orders restricted information, basically classifying that information. Um, polyinstantiation is a control where you restrict the number of queries made. Uh, that's what we talked about before, where you make sure that there is some record, even for the highly privileged people, there's a low privileged record there, and the restricting number of queries is an aggregation control. They won't let you ask too many queries at a time, so you can't get a large database of the unprivileged information. So data mining is the practice of going through some large database to find something useful in there. And this is for example, commonly done on the web. You harvest something like all the chat messages on some forum like Twitter or something, and you try to figure out who to sell your product to that way. Um, or you mine transaction records to figure out the suspicious transactions. This is called data mining, and data analytics is figuring out how to understand normal use and detect unusual use um, to find fraud or attacks or other things that stand out. So countermeasures, uh, defense in depth, are multiple overlapping controls. You don't have just one firewall. You have an enterprise class firewall on the outside, and then a firewall on each machine, and then antivirus on the machine, and then network segmentation. And these are things that help protect you in general, even if your other defenses don't work. Um, administrative controls, like policies, procedures, and standards, and physical controls, like locks and guards. All these are various countermeasures that limit the harm of attacks. And in mobile device attacks, you've got a problem. People bring all mobile devices in, and they can take data away, and they can bring in malware. And that introduced, that means you don't really have a network perimeter anymore. With a firewall, where you can say all the data inside had to go through the firewall, a lot of data is being carried in past your defenses into your network. So there are defenses. You can restrict the use of these devices by policy. You can disable connections like USB drives. 
Um, you can allow only certain trusted devices. Your company can give you a special USB stick, which is the only one you're allowed to use for company data, and it's therefore encrypted and so on. There are technologies to limit that you can only use the official USB stick, not random ones, which is a pretty good policy. And uh, to counter measures against theft of those mobile devices, you can back up the data. You can have mobile device management systems that encrypt it and remote wipe it, and so on. So, you know, these are uh, useful countermeasures to limit the risk of all those mobile devices. Let's take a look at a Kahoot. All right. Let's see if Kahoot's going to work. It had trouble last time. I used it a few days ago. Looks like it's working normally. online. So I expect to probably get about 11 in here. It seems to be about half the people. Ah, I found the emojis. Cows and uh, lions and alligators. Good. <laughs> Wait a few seconds to see if they come back. Well, all right. Let's give it a shot. All right. So what is it the FBI wants to add to the iPhones? Yes, speed, speed to answer does matter on the Kahoot. It rates you on accuracy and speed. And backdoor is what they want to add. They want to check everybody's iPhone to see if they have forbidden material on it. Uh, it keeps coming up. Every law enforcement agency in the world pretty much wants to do that. So far, they have been resisted mostly by Apple. All right, so what threat destroys a system on a certain date? Yeah, you can get up to a thousand points on each question, rating you on accuracy and speed. All right, that's a logic bomb. All right. See, somebody got, yeah, almost a thousand on each one. Ruhani did. All right. So, what language tends to have RFI vulnerabilities? And that's when PHP has remote file inclusion. All right. Which organization puts out the top 10 web vulnerabilities? Oh, 
All right, that's OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project. All right, so what attack search is a large database for useful information? Uh, data mining. All right. All right, Damien. All right. Now I think we're down to encryption. My favorite topic. Yeah, all right, so we'll talk about various forms of cryptography and then some physical stuff that we we'll probably won't get to till next time. So, in cryptography, um, cryptology is the science of communications, cryptography is secret writing, and cryptanalysis is breaking systems of cryptography to, if, to find out if they're weak. So a cipher is the algorithm that you use to scramble messages. Plain text is an unencrypted readable message and when you encrypt it, you turn it into ciphertext, which is scrambled and unreadable. And decryption turns the ciphertext back into plain text. So the goal is to achieve confidentiality and integrity. Confidentiality means unauthorized people cannot read the secrets. Um, and integrity means that unauthorized people cannot modify the information that's been encrypted. You would like to have both of those properties. Authentication is another desirable property where not only is the thing secret, but it's also signed so you can tell who sent it. And non-repudiation means that people cannot deny what they did later. So that means you have some kind of log or audit records that cannot be erased. So subjects cannot later claim, deny what they've done. So now you can sign something like a loan agreement, and then you can be held to the terms of it because you can't deny that you signed it. These are all desirable properties of cryptography. So uh, the fundamental desirable properties of the algorithm are that you should have confusion and diffusion. Confusion means there should be no relationship between the plain text and the cipher text. For example, um, the, the, cipher, the, the Caesar cipher just encrypts one letter of cipher text makes one letter of plain text. So if you have a five letter word in plain text, you get a five letter word in cipher text. So the length of the word is obviously preserved and that's a failure of confusion. There is a relationship between the plain text and the ciphertext. Diffusion should mean the plain text should be dispersed throughout the ciphertext. So if you change one letter in the plain text, it should change many letters in the ciphertext, not just one letter in one location. Those are both desirable properties for an encryption algorithm. So substitution provides confusion. This replaces one character with another. That way the characters aren't the same. And permutation, rearranging the letters, provides diffusion so that the change in one place changes things in other places in the ciphertext. So your cryptographic strength, um, if you have strong encryption, then it is difficult or impossible to decrypt without the key. And the work factor is how you measure it. How long would it take to try all the keys and break in? And then you, if that time is long enough, then you call it a strong system. Um, secrecy of the system does not provide strength. This is a very common mistake. People have some system and they keep it a secret and they think nobody will figure it out. But it turns out there are only a few ways to do this. They've all been figured out centuries ago. And um, so the modern plan, the modern belief is that you should publish the algorithm. You shouldn't try to keep it a secret. You should just have a good algorithm. There's a standard one you can trust. Uh, the proprietary ones tend to be foolish and broken. Um, so a monoalphabetic Substitution cipher changes one plain text letter to one cipher text letter, and uh, this is um, easy to break by frequency analysis. The most the letters are not all equally probable. E is far more probable than any other letter, so if you change E to some other letter and it's always the same, I can just count and find the most common letter, and that's probably E, and I can do that uh, for other letters, so pretty quickly you can crack it. Um, polyalphabetic ciphers have multiple substitutions for each letter. So an E sometimes goes to one letter and sometimes to another letter, so it helps resist frequency analysis. So modular arithmetic is what's used for all forms of cryptography. You, um, 
have something like a byte with say 256 values and when you encrypt it you still want to have a byte so you work on a ring like a clock face you have numbers that just go around in a loop they don't just grow bigger and bigger they just go around a loop so this is how modular arithmetic works 11 plus 1 is 0 I'm cool. you have 0 instead of 12 to be the way it's done so you add 1 to 11 you're back at 0 if you take 7 and you add another 7 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 you get 2 and if you have 1 minus 2, you get 11. So that's what ring math is like, modular math. You're on a ring, so the answer is always a number on that ring. You can still multiply and add and subtract, but you'll never leave this range of values. Exclusive OR is another really common cryptographic way of combining a key with data. It's used in a lot of cryptographic systems as part of it. So the way it works is you have one bit of plain text and one bit of key. And if those two bits are the same, the answer is zero. And if those two bits are different, the answer is one. That's called exclusive OR. So zero exclusive OR one is one, and one exclusive OR zero is also one. But if you're both ones or both zeros, then the answer is zero. This is real important. Notice that if I put in half zeros and half ones, I get out half zeros and half ones. This is really important. If you didn't have that property, then it would be destroying information. For example, if I did an or, then one or one would be one. So if I put in half zeros and half ones, I would get out three quarters ones and only one quarter zero, and that would destroy information. That kind of transformation is a lossy transformation and it cannot be reversed. There'd be no way to decrypt it. You have to have an information preserving transformation like this, where if you send in half ones and half zeros, you still have half ones and half zeros. Otherwise, the entropy would change and you would have destroyed information. So, you can reverse XOR. As you can imagine, another way to look at XOR is where the key is a zero, you don't change the input. Where the key is one, you flip the bit. So if you do it, if you XOR it again with the same key, then you'll just get back where you started because the ones you didn't flip will not be flipped again. The ones you flipped will be flipped back to the original value. So XORing once to encrypt, XOR again with the same key to decrypt. It's the same algorithm. And there are online websites you can do it to see it. So that's a, a fact to know about XOR. So to encrypt data at rest, this will protect a laptop when the power is off. Like you send a laptop in your luggage, the power is off, and you don't want Steve to be able to steal the data, so you do hold disk encryption, and then nobody can get in without the key, which would be the password. To encrypt data in motion, you have to have encryption at one end that is decrypted at the other end, and this is what you get from a VPN or HTTPS and so on, some kind of end-to-end -end encryption of data in motion. So you choose appropriate encryption methods to try to make it fast means it doesn't take too much processor time. The strength means it's very difficult for an attacker to break in, how much it costs to implement, um, how complex it is to program, and therefore how likely you are to make a mistake in the program, and there are other considerations. So there's quite a lot of different encryption methods, more than you might imagine, that uh, have been developed to deal with various situations of those considerations. So 3F is here. And NIST just approved last week a new set of small encryption algorithms for uh, Internet of Things devices called ASCOT or something like that. AS something. A new, supposed to be smaller than the ones we use now like AES and RSA and such. never used this new system yet, but I'll have to figure it out and put it in the encryption class next time it comes around. So a video shows Marjorie at a meeting. Now she can't deny that she went to that meeting. So what is that? A 
It's non-repudiation, where you have evidence that proves you did something, so you can't deny it. That's true. The video could be fake, and that's true of everything. Nothing is perfect. That's right. Log entries could be fake, too. That's right. So you have evidence, but no evidence is ever 100% perfect. Absolutely. All right, so Caesar moves each letter three steps in the alphabet. So what system is that? This was military and grade encryption in like 400 BC. Substitution. Each letter is replaced by another letter, all right, which is good enough when you have a time when almost nobody can read it all anyway. Even a small modification of letters is enough to fool them. All right. What systems resist frequency analysis? Alphabetic systems. All right. And what is seventeen mod five? It's two, you divide by five and take the remainder. Now, I should mention, as I recall, I did not see any math questions of this type on a CISSP exam. Although in principle, they're in the material, but they don't seem to care about that level of detail. But anyway, the answer is two. And here's another one like that. Um, what is three X or four? I see a lot of people getting it, and I'll talk about that after I record the scores, in case uh, people don't know that. So it's, uh, oh, that's faces. Okay, no wonder I can't read it. All right. So Billy's run twice. And we hung. Good. And this is faces. All right. Good. So uh, let me just mention, the XOR one is one where I often get questions. So... So if you have, we're doing three XOR four. And so three in binary is say zero, one, one. Uh, one, one, and one, two. And four is one, zero, zero. So when you XOR, the zero and one are different, so you get one. The zero and one are different, so you get one. And the zero and one are different, so you get one. So the answer is seven. That's why... Uh, that's perhaps surprising result that 3x or 4 is 7. All right. So let's see. I think we can probably do another section before we take a break. Let's do that. I think they're pretty short. Eh, well, we'll start this one. We might stop partway through. All right. Um, so the history of cryptography. Um, the Spartans would take a message, write it, and then wrap it around a stick, and then read it this way, so you're getting maybe every sixth or seventh letter. So that's one way to rearrange the letters without changing them to make them hard to read. Uh, the Caesar cipher I mentioned would just move everything forward a certain number of steps in the alphabet. Microsoft still uses ROT13, where it moves everything forward 13 characters in the alphabet in the registry. It is a ridiculous antiquated system, but they do it. Um, all right. And the Vignair square was a polyalphabetic cipher where you would have a word 
that shows the first, you'd like use the word eagle. So the first letter would be encrypted with the E row, and the next letter with the A row, and the next letter with the G row, and so on. So you'd use a different alphabet for each letter in a pattern, and that was to resist frequency analysis. It's really quite strong. And uh, the, um, I think this was the um, Confederates just had a wheel like this, like you might get in a box of cereal, where you rotate the letters to shift everything forward. It's a little gadget to make the, uh, the Caesar cipher. Yeah, here's the one. The Confederate States of America had a cipher disk like this. You just rotate it and they make it easy to decrypt things. Not a very strong system at all, but they used it. And then there's a book cipher where you just pick words out of a book, like out of the Bible or something, and then you have the page, paragraph, and word, and these numbers turn into words, and there's no pattern at all. The only way to crack it is to figure out what book they're using and get an exact copy of that book. Uh, running key cipher, I mentioned before you'd use a, um, a phrase here, like we the people or something as the key. So you'd have, uh, that would be your secret key, would be some common phrase. Um, and code books, assign a code word for certain things, like the US Secret Service, Joe Biden is Celtic, Donald Trump was mogul, and so on. Secret Service has code words for the first family, and a lot of people have these code words to use uh, to, cons to obscure who you're talking about. The one-time pad is the perfect encryption system. It's still used occasionally. It is completely unbreakable. No one's ever found any flaw in it. The only problem is key distribution is difficult. You have to have pages of key, just random letters, and then you encrypt each message with some letters on one page and you never use any part of that key again. Next time you encrypt, you go to a different page. So there's no pattern at all in the ciphertext. This is perfect. The only problem is you have to distribute the whole book of key in advance. So, and then you can never reuse any part of it. So you have to have some way of securely distributing large amounts of key material all the time. And that turns out to be almost impossible in practice. So this is very rarely used. But if you can use it, it's essentially perfectly unbreakable. There is no mathematical pattern in the output at all. There is no way to break it. So Project Verona, the KGB used one-time PED in World War II. But uh, the problem is they had trouble distributing enough key materials, so they made extra copies of the same one-time pad and shared it for multiple messages. And if you do that, it shatters like glass. It becomes easy to break, and I've got this in a cryptography class. If you reuse the key on a one-time pad, it becomes very easy to break. All right, and Herburn machines were these machines like manual typewriters, like the Enigma had, which you just have gears and such, you dial in the key, and then when you press letters, different letters are typed out. So if you have that physical device, it's just doing a mathematical transformation of the letters, but it turned out to be really quite strong, and I think the only way they cracked it was by actually stealing one of the machines. Yeah, the Enigma machine, that's a, a lot of people had these. So there are cryptography laws to block you from exporting cryptographic information. Um, there was the one in effect to 94, blocking a lot of exports. And then there's the Wassenaar arrangement in 96 that relaxed a lot of restrictions on cryptography. Uh, there's quite a big deal. Windows XP could not be exported to hostile nations. They had to make a special version of it because in the 90s, um, uh, maybe it was an earlier version of Windows, but anyway, there's a lot of software was blocked to go to a lot of countries because of the legal export rules. So um, symmetric encryption is the kind that's been around for thousands of years where you have to have a key to encrypt the data and the person at the other end has to have the same key. So you somehow have to share the secret key and that's a problem. Asymmetric cryptography is very new. It was invented in 1979. And this way, you do not need to share a secret key. Each user has two keys, a private key and a public key, and everybody shares their public key and they keep their private key private. And this way, it's much it solves the key distribution problem, which is the problem of symmetric encryption, where you give somebody you know, a shared secret is an oxymoron. It's a secret, and yet you share it, and how do you know they didn't give it to somebody else? Well, you don't, and that would ruin it. Here, you don't ever give your secret to anybody. Now, hashing is an integrity solution, not a confidentiality solution. You can put a hash value on something, and then you can verify that it hasn't been altered by recalculating the hash value. So this is useful to verify that a download is intact. It doesn't encrypt anything, it doesn't conceal anything, it just provides an integrity control, so you can make sure that something has not been altered. All right, so uh, 
So in symmetric encryption, like I say, you have a secret key used to encrypt and decrypt. You have to somehow share that with the recipient, and you have to somehow trust them not to make extra copies of it or lose it. And if they do, then it, it violates your uh, security. So stream ciphers encrypt one bit at a time. You just have a stream of bits and of cipher of, uh, of key bits coming out. You have a stream of data. You just XOR them to send them out. That's what RC4 does. Block ciphers are more common where you have a block of data. Uh, you, these 64 bits blocks were used by DES, now AES. The main one uses 128 bits blocked, 16 characters at a time. Blam, you encrypt that block, one block by block. Initialization vector is a random value added to the plain text before encryption so that if you have another message that starts with the same word, it will not have the same result. And chaining uses the result of one block to make a seed like an initialization vector for the next block so that if you have two sequential blocks of data with the same data, they don't have the same resulting ciphertext. DES was the standard uh, used for a long time. It was the official American standard used by the military and private sector, and it turned out to be not strong enough. In fact, it's very suspicious. The NSA obviously weakened it deliberately because IBM proposed a 128-bit key, and the government lowered it to 56 for no good reason, which was widely believed to be because then they could crack it with high-powerful uh, secret computers. So they find these modes, the electronic code book, and these other ones, cipher block chaining, cipher feedback, output feedback, and counter mode. Um, the electronic codebook mode is the one that is normally called textbook encryption, and it has got a security flaw. This is where you take each block of data and you just encrypt it with the key. There's no initialization vector and no chaining. And so the problem is, if you encrypt a message like this, like an image like this, where there's a large block of green, every block of green encrypts to the same color. So you still have the shapes preserved. Because if you have an input, an input block that's the same, you have an output block that's the same. So this ECB mode has a flaw that it does not really hide all the patterns in the input. So um, cipher block chaining is much better. The output of each encrypted block is used as an initialization vector for the next one, and now even an area of solid color turns into random snow, which is what you want. And all these other techniques will have the same result. They all have some way of adding some extra data to the next block to prevent identical blocks of input from having the same result. So single DES it was the original way of single 56-bit key, and the problem is you could try two to the 56 keys. That's not impossible with a large network of computers, so it's not considered secure. The key is just not long enough. Processors are powerful enough to do two to the 56 calculations these days. So <coughs> they moved to triple DES. To fix that, if uh, you would have three rounds of dress, of DES using either two or three different keys, and this gives you effectively 112 bits of security, which is considered good. Anything over 100 bits is considered effectively unbreakable. So, um, IDEA is another algorithm that's out there, uh, International Placement for DES. It has a 128-bit key and is considered secure, but it's encumbered by patents and slower than AES, so it's not used very often. Um, AES is the standard approved by the U.S. government to replace DES, and it is considered very good, very fast, very efficient, and effectively unbreakable. No flaws have been found. It's been out there for a long time. Uh, three key lengths, the only kind everybody, anybody ever seems to use is 128 or 256, and uh, everybody is pretty happy with it. Um, all right. The way this works is the National Institute of Standards has a competition where they specify the rules and various people submit cryptographic systems and then they analyze them and if any of them are cracked, they remove them. And so there were five finalists and anybody that made it to the final round is a very good system that you could use. Mars, RC6, Ringel, Serpent, and Twofish were all considered good. Ringel is the one that won and was used to make AES. The others are the runners-up. So if you want to do business with the military or the government, then you use AES, which is the standard. And if you mistrust the government and suspect that they might have poisoned AES or something because they have done that in the past, and you want strong encryption without it being the one officially recommended by the government, you can choose one of these runners-up. And the mathematics will be fine, and you'll be outside the government system. So that's right. So there's a, this shows the animation of how RIN jail works. And I'll just mention in general terms, you add a key, 
you substitute bytes, you shift rows, you mix columns, and you add a round key, and you do this nine times, then the last round you skip one step. So the transformations are very simple, just flipping a few bits around. Um, it's designed to be easy and fast on computers. Can quantum computers break AES? Uh, no, there is an algorithm to attack AES with quantum computers, and all it does is it manages to cut the key length in half. So you can crack perhaps AES-128 with two to the 64 operations on a quantum computer, but if you do AES-256, you won't be able to crack it even with a quantum computer. So the worst thing that will happen if quantum computers become very good is we'll just have to switch to the stronger form of AES. However, RSA is toast. Even going to a million bit key would not be enough. Quantum computers will doom all current uh, public key systems. And that's why there are new ones being approved right now. So Blowfish and Twofish were invented by Bruce Schneier, a very famous cryptographer, and they're freely available, and they have many different sizes. And I think, well, I say one of them, I think was a finalist. Yeah, Twofish was a finalist, so they're perfectly fine. They just were not chosen to be the winner and turn into AES. Um, RC5 and RC6 are from Ron Rivest, and uh, that's RSA Laboratories, and they're also, I think, uh, unencumbered by patents and available. And asymmetric encryption is the encryption where everybody has to have two keys. Originally, RSA used prime numbers, and there are other systems using things like elliptic curves. So every user makes two keys, a private key and a public key. And you publish the public key on an open web server. Anybody can find it, and you never tell anybody the private key. And now anybody can send you messages with the public key, and only you can open them with private key. So it's very good, very effective. The only problem is it's receive only. If you publish a key pair, that does not give you the ability to send messages to anybody, but only to receive them. The person who wants to receive a message has to make their own key pair, and that turns out to be a little difficult to do, so that's a problem. And however, the simple example, you have a mail slot on your door and a locked door. Anybody can put mail in and you can get it. This is what public, public key encryption is like. You can now receive messages securely, but you can't send anything. You can just receive. The person at the other end would have to make their own slot, and that's what it is here. All right. So uh, this happened to Ed Snowden. You know, Ed Snowden wanted to smuggle American secrets, uh, NSA secrets away and he wanted to do it by RSA, but he couldn't do it to journalists because they weren't technical enough to make a key pair. And he was recording videos trying to teach them, and they eventually had the journalist Glenn Greenwald, they had to add um, a technician to her team, to his team, that could do the key encryption. That's a problem. R RSA is difficult to use. And uh, you, the person at the other end has to have somebody technical on the team, which is a problem. All right, so you have to have a one-way function as part of all these things. There must be a way to calculate the public key from the private key. So if you know the private key, you should be able to calculate the public key, but you should not be able to deduce the private key from the public key. So that's called a one-way function, where there's a calculation that's easy in one direction, but hard to reverse. And all cryptography relies on this. There must be a fast way to encrypt, but decrypting without the key is very difficult. So here's the one-way functions. RSA used factoring a large number into its component primes. If you multiply two large numbers, it's very hard to find those numbers from the product. Discrete logarithm is a generalization of the same thing, and elliptic curves is another way to make a difficult problem. That's one way easy and the other way hard. So symmetric algorithms use shorter keys and are faster, much faster. RSA, um, so when you use RSA, you do not encrypt your whole message with asymmetric cryptography, you just encrypt an AES key, and then use that afterwards just for efficiency. Um, all right, so NIST has a document recommending key sizes. Um, and uh, so the asymmetric, uh, they recommend that you should have at least 112 bits of security, which is the, um, that it would take two to the 112 calculations to get in. And I see that now 128 is now what's recommended from 2031 and beyond. Up through 2030, you could have 112 bits of security. Beyond 2031, they say you better have uh, at least 128 bits of security. And that means for symmetric algorithms like AES, um, your symmetric key strength to 80 and 112 would be just the length of the key. But for asymmetric key systems like RSA, you'd have a 1,024 or 2048-bit key. And so there are various lengths. And uh, here you are in a 
Now you would have to have, for RSA, you'd have to have 3,072 bits to have the 128. So by 2030, your keys for RSA should be at least 3,000 bits long. That's the official recommendation from the government. And probably by then we'll be moving to quantum safe algorithms, which are being approved probably within the next year. All right. And so they've talked about this. Um, there's other recommendations for various ones, key sizes. All right. And then there's hash functions. Hash functions, you combine all the data in the input file down to a fingerprint. Um, one simple one was checksum. Checksum would just count how many ones there are in a byte, and whether it's even or odd. That's one number to measure something about it. The MD5 was an old one, 128 bits long. It's not good enough. You can forge another message that would match the MD5 under certain conditions. SHA-1 was considered much better, but uh, Google broke it about eight years ago. They managed to make two PDFs with the same SHA-1, so it is no longer perfect. SHA-2 is considered unbreakable, 224 bits or longer. Uh, it is impossible, as far as anybody knows, to make another message with the same SHA-2. And SHA-3 is a replacement for SHA-2 in case SHA-2 is ever broken, but so far there seems to be no problem with SHA-2. So that's called a collision. If you can find two files that have the same hash, that's called a collision, and the best hash function should have no known collisions. MD5 has plots of collisions. SHA-1 has had a collision since 2017 that's known, and so everybody's moving to SHA-2 now to get a system with no collisions. All right, let's take a look at a Kahoot. Linux's SHA-512 sum, SHA-1, SHA-2, or SHA-3? I think it is SHA-2, but you'd have to look at the documentations to be sure. But I'm pretty sure that's SHA-2. Almost nobody is using SHA-3 for anything yet. Because nobody has found any problem with SHA-2. I don't even think it's been proven that SHA-3 is better than SHA-2. It was just different. Anyway. All right, so what's the strongest system on this list? essentially perfect, unbreakable. It just has a key distribution problem, but if you can distribute the key properly, nobody can ever break it. All right, what process has no key? Hashing, good. It makes a fingerprint for a message. There's no key involved. All right, which cipher encrypts bits one at a time? That's called a stream cipher. You have a stream of data and a stream of key bits, uh, and you just XOR them together. All 
All right, which mode preserves some patterns in the input? A serious flaw for a cryptographic system. That's the electronic code book. If you have two blocks of input that are the same, you get the same result. All right, what's the weakest scheme on this list? Yeah, DES. DES is old and broken and not recommended for use anymore. All the rest of these are okay. This is the best one, government approved, but the others are okay. But DES is actually no longer recommended because it can be broken without knowledge of the key. All right, which one is popular on mobile devices? The electric curve uses much less CPU time and much less battery power to do encryption than RSA, so it's favored on mobile devices. The keys are shorter and the calculations are faster. TOH, well, they'll have to tell me more about it. They won't actually get the credit. Um, and uh, FC, I know who that is. All right. All right, and I see TOH. All right, good, I've got your name. All right, so let me stop this recording and we'll take a break. Uh, 10 minutes.